Hey, Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, Brittany. Thank you for having me. Of course. Very happy to have you. This has been a one of the most exciting episodes that, you know, this is the first time somebody said, hey, we're coming out of stealth mode and we want you to tell the story. That's a really fun episode, but also definitely uh, I feel a little unprepared, but I'm excited to learn once again, right next to my listeners. Absolutely. Sounds great. <laughs> Where are you calling us from today? I'm in New Jersey, uh, but our company has people all over the globe. So it's very exciting. Oh my goodness. How many locations are there? Or I guess is the there number is, escapes me, but we are in, we're in Texas. We're in New York, New Jersey, Greece, all over the place. Wow. California. Okay. Wow. Yeah. See, I see. I already have so many questions. I'm skipping ahead. All right. Let's <laughs> get back down the show runs y'all. Um, let's start with you and your background. Our listeners love to learn about our guests. So please tell us a little bit about your personal story in terms of, you know, um, your academic history, you know, or what, when did you get into women's health? Have you always been in women's health and how did you end up at Femtech Health? Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, I am a microbiologist and immunologist by training. So I have a PhD in, in immunology and microbial pathogenesis. Oh, so God. I, got I love bacteria. I love bacteria. They're my favorite. Me too. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, at the time in my graduate work, I was studying Legionnaire's disease and the pathogenicity of that organism. And but it, when I, you know, right after I finished my PhD, I went into, into industry and I started working at Johnson & Johnson Consumer. And it was right at that point where the human microbiome field started becoming much more important, much more researched and understood in this idea of, you know, bacteria are not all bad. We don't need to just study how they're pathogenic and can, you know, cause us issues. Let's look at what they're doing to be beneficial. And so that really, that sort of junction, that tipping point was when I started getting in, you know, when I started working at Johnson and Johnson. And it was really what my job was there was really to bring this science. It ended up being bringing this science into our portfolio of brands. And because I was working in a consumer company, I was focused obviously on consumer product development and research in that space. So I did a lot of work mostly on the skin microbiome. But at, you know, so I was studying the development of the infant skin microbiome over time from birth all the way as, as infants age into childhood, as well as the microbiome in adults in healthy skin, dry skin, eczema, et cetera. And I also had the opportunity because we had a number of women's healthcare brands to work on KY and Monistat and start to understand the microbiome of the vaginal environment as well as the gut. So I really have touched on all of the, you know, how the microbiome can relate to health in a number of um, body areas of the human. And, and really, it's been a fascinating exploration because we don't know very much at all. We know some things, but there's still <laughs> quite a bit to learn, particularly in the vaginal microbiome. That is such a scientific thing to say, to be like, and it's so exciting. We know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As scientists, so that that's I have so many questions. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Um, well, if I could actually dig in a little bit here, um, because we are going to talk about the microbiome. So first, do you mind offering just a definition to our non-scientific listeners? What, what's your definition of the microbiome? Absolutely. I think the, you know, the traditional definition of the microbiome is the, the organisms, meaning the microbes, the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses. When we say microbiome, though, we really are referring to just the bacteria because we have special names for all the other ones. But the microbiome really is the bacteria, their genetic components, and the environment they live in. But the way we talk about it today, we're really referring to the bacteria, the organisms that live in an environment in your healthy state. And what they're doing in there is, is what we're researching. Got it. And we've talked before on the show about gut microbiome. I think a lot of people are like, you know, they understand that there's bacteria in our stomachs and our GI system. We also understand there's vaginal microbiome, but I don't think we've ever talked about skin microbiome. So you're telling me that there's bacteria, just like layers of bacteria on my skin. And by the way, uh, for those not watching the video on YouTube, I'm itching my arms because I just can't <laughs> not. And when you talk about this. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, what the microbiome is doing in any organ of your body is, you know, 
one first and foremost taking up space so other organisms don't start colonizing those areas uh -huh. so the idea is that these organisms on your skin they're part of your skin as well as the the cells that you know are the human part of your skin so they really live on the surface of your skin there's some controversy how far down into the skin they're actually viable but they are definitely on the surface and they definitely have a signature that you can follow over time and so as i was mentioning in the beginning when you're born the mic you get colonized, you start to become colonized on your skin by these bacteria. Mm -hmm. And it changes as your skin changes because you're growing, your skin is evolving, the structure of the function of your skin shifts over time. And so does the microbiome. But around puberty, it becomes, you know, as the sebum and, you know, people get acne at that time because oil production starts to ramp up because of changes in hormone levels. That's when your microbiome becomes a more adult like signature. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes very much like your microbial fingerprint in that it stays relatively stable for quite a long time and is very unique to you. And that idea can transcend into all the other areas of your body, like your vaginal environment too. Yeah. Does the areola have a specific microbiome? It does indeed. And it's related to how, you know, the, the baby nursing and the breast, the skin of the, of the breast and the areola has a very specific signature. Uh, last question about skin microbiome previous research you've done <laughs> before we dive into the company is um, uh, did you find or do we know if a c-section versus vaginal birth changes that skin microbiome because I can imagine a uh, inoculation is very different when you're being pulled out by sterile hands versus out of a giant vagina you know absolutely and that's one of the areas that we were looking into and there's a lot of research in that space and so Essentially, what we know is that, yes, if you're not, if you're born by vaginal delivery, you're getting inoculated by all those vaginal and gut microbes that are in that environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so that helps to, to seed the gut flora, as, as I'm sure your, your listeners have heard before in your previous shows, um, but it also seeds your skin microbiome. And if you're born by cesarean section, you don't pick up all those organisms right away. So there's a delay, but you do eventually pick them up through, you know, mom and dad and touching other family members and, and cross inoculation, if you will, from other people. people not washing their hands. Exactly. <laughs> but it's, a, you know, it's a natural and a very important process of setting yeah. up your initial microbiome. Absolutely. All right. So you are the chief scientific officer of Femtech Health. What is Femtech Health? Well, Femtech Health is a health and beauty sciences company. So what we're doing here is bringing together this idea of health and wellness into one space. The concept here is that women's health is one, very under-researched and very fragmented. So in the, you know, as in the femtech space, there might be point solutions that exist for fertility or for menopause or for sexual dysfunction, all these things. And the idea is women often have a challenging time understanding what the options are for her and where she can go to find them. So if you bring them together under one umbrella, which is what Femtech Health is, we're providing essentially these health and beauty services across the continuum of life. So from you know the teenage years and getting into menstruating and understanding your body and all of the needs that you have as a younger woman, all the way to menopause, we have solutions and science-backed products and services. So also bringing all of that together, not just services, not just products, but all of it in a holistic ecosystem. So is Femtech Health going to make its own products? Because there are so many products already established that are fantastic, right? Um, but are you going to make all of your own or are you get more of a marketplace having validated right. other people's products? That's a great question. So what we're doing today is we're making our own science-backed products because there, there was some room for improvement in the dietary supplement space with respect to you know, the, the supplements that one can use to help support wellness, both mm -hmm. from urinary health or menopause or for PMS. There are great products out there too, but we had the opportunity to make our own here and offer them to women within our ecosystem. That's not to say that we wouldn't partner with awesome other brands that have great products because the whole idea is really to provide women's solution. And if we can partner with great other femtech companies and products and bring solutions to women, I think that would be wonderful. Um, so y'all just came out of stealth and what a punch you did uh, coming out, like raise this much money, acquire this many companies offering this. Can you give our listeners kind of um, uh, a snapshot of the press release? You know, how much has been raised? Who have you required? Who, who have you acquired? Um, and where is like the current state of Femtech Health? Yes, absolutely. So right now, what we have done is, you know, we've built Femtech Health as a, the initial platform and we've acquired 
three other companies, Birchbox, as a part of our sort of beauty offering. And so we can talk about that briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, Mira Beauty, which is really a sort of an AI kind of based sort of integration into you know, helping women select the right kinds of products for them. So using that platform to drive into wellness space as a, as a part of that acquisition uh, process. And then Liquid Grids, which is really building communities to help us you know, find women and help women find us so that they can understand what possibilities are there for them. So we're really bringing together, you know, a lot of us on the femtech you know, executive team are scientists and technologists who've been in the science background and health industry for a long time, like our CEO. And we're bringing in these uh, mechanisms by which to you know, one, connect to women and their communities and to bring health and wellness into this beauty sector and vice versa, because it's really all related. I mean, as women, we feel good when we feel healthy and beauty products and the, the things that we do to help accentuate our health also make us feel better. And, and so really there's an opportunity to bring it all together. Yeah. The, other, the other piece of it is that, you know, the beauty industry really understands women and how to speak to women and the healthcare industry can learn a lot from that. Mm, that's an interesting point I haven't heard yet because that, you know, one argument I think about is, um, um, you know, how can you hold up treating a woman's uterine fibroids who's like, it's crippling and chronic and horrible to like, oh, and we also sell mascara. So can you give us an argument for like why, why and how those can or should potentially live in the same world at the same time? Exactly. Yeah. It, one is, you know, it's the idea to really, you know, again, bring this wellness piece into the beauty sector. You know, beauty has, you know, skincare. I, I was saying at the beginning how I focus a lot yeah. of my time in my previous life on, on skincare and skin health. And there's a lot that we can do. And there are many products that can, you know, really move the needle and advance skin health and provide you with healthy skin for, you know, longer term in your life. Then you have makeup and beauty products that accentuate, you know, that healthy skin that you might have. You know, all of these things can affect the way you feel about yourself, mental health. And this is, you know, again, goes then to that healthcare piece. So they're very much interconnected. You know, you feel better when you feel like you look your best. And that is a part of your state of health because your mental health is an enormous part of that. And the mm -hmm. feedback that that then provides you, you're feeling confident, you can go about your day, you can take care of yourself maybe better than you would if you didn't feel so great. Yeah, that's just an example of, of how it can become connected. Can women engage with Femtech Health and not do the makeup stuff or the skin Absolutely. care stuff? Absolutely. So maybe I can clarify how it works, right? So Femtech is the parent company and we're, we are creating a, a direct to consumer, um, basically healthcare company, which is going to launch in January time called Awesome Woman. And that is a very much science-backed product and services offering. That is how we will bring these solutions to women. We have Birchbox, that acquisition was, was really the, the beauty side of things. And part mm -hmm. of that is to continue Birchbox as it is because people love that brand and they love the discovery of it and bring the discovery of wellness into Birchbox. Mm -hmm. So to, to really help women understand these are opportunities that you could explore and introduce them to some of these new ideas. Definitely. And so, um, is awesome woman. So it's, mo I I'm hearing you talk about like the subscription box, like ex she may get like skincare products, but she may also get awkward essentials, dripsticks. She may also get, uh, you know, healthy lube for her sexual wellness, or I don't know, uh, CBD infused tampon or whatever we're talking about here. Um, is there other ways that she can engage? Is it just a subscription box or what are other ways that women touch Femtech Health? Is Awesome Woman have more offerings or are there other companies under Femtech Health? Yep. So Awesome Woman will really be our, you know, sort of doorway into this health and health sort of science-backed product and services offering. So what we want to do is make this accessible for women. We don't want to have, you know, a platform by which only certain women can access because it's too costly, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's one exciting thing about this is, is really providing access to women to the kind of healthcare and the, you know, the physicians and the, the, the doctors that actually understand women and women's health issues. And that is not necessarily going to involve Access, you know, getting products in a box every month. It's really providing a membership service to this women's health ecosystem. And there they can get telemedicine services, they get their birth control, they can get uh, any kind of care that from a, 
you know, mental health care eventually, all of that will be built in. Financial services, because women really, you know, helping manage money uh -huh. as we become more, um, you know, the, the breadwinners in the economic environment, you know, that is providing access to women. In addition to that, we have an opportunity to, again, if you want, provide you access to wellness products in addition to that, that can help su supplement wellness and keep you on that healthy track. The whole idea is about prevention, right? You don't yeah. need to get sick if you're taking care of yourself. Perhaps you can prevent that from happening. Absolutely. And so the CEO and founder, Dr. Uh, Kiman, he is I mean, whoa, what a resume um, has had multiple, very, very large uh, healthcare exits. How and when, if you know, you're speaking on his behalf kind of here, but uh, do you know how, when, and did he see a need in women's health? Cause I don't think that his previous companies were in women's health. So how, and did he think, come up with this? Right. So, you know, come on, I've known come on for a number of years. Cause I met him through my, my former life and my former role. Uh, and, you know, he's a passionate champion of women overall, and he always has been this way. And I think if you look at his previous companies, a lot of what he has been, you know, really championing is this idea of bringing these disparate aspects of a healthcare environment together. For example, in diabetes, this is exactly what he did, is to bring these areas together to make, to simplify and to you know, make it easier for diabetics to access their care. And so when he looked at the environment going on in women's health and what is happening with these point solutions and, and not having it all integrated and coordinated, he saw a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in addition to the opportunity, you know, from a marketplace standpoint, he knows a lot of really amazing women that he saw an opportunity to help champion and bring into this new company, such as myself. I was very fortunate for, you know, to have known him and for he and I to connect on this venture. And it's, it's really, we have such an amazing executive leadership team, all women who come from all different backgrounds. And he's been able to provide this amazing platform for us to bring it forward. Wow. And I think you, uh, the, the press has said you've raised almost $40 million, uh, pre coming out into the public. Was that money? Um, you know, I know founders are listening, being like, what I have, I have my revenue. I have this, I have that. And I'm still struggling to fundraise. How, uh, was that able to happen? Was it because of his previous exits that he was able to fundraise and who are some of those major investors? Exactly. So, you know, come on, like I said, is very invested in this and he is one of the major investors. And, and that's a big part of the, the reason that we can do what we're doing and, and create this ecosystem in the way that he's envisioned it and that we're all helping bring together. So we're very fortunate. A lot of that has to do with his previous success and his network of, of entrepreneurs that are really invested in helping us move the needle for women's health. Mm -hmm. Um, so your background is in the skin microbiome, right? And I'm looking at the Femtech Health website and it's talking a lot about the skin microbiome and like there's this biome AI tool. Tell us more about why, I mean, I know why you and I love the skin microbiome. Why is Femtech Health taking that up as like a main initiative within the company? Sure. So, you know, while I have studied a lot of the skin microbiome, I our, our major focus to begin with in Femtech Health is of course the vaginal microbiome, mm -hmm. because that is the, you know, one of the microbiomes in, our, in the woman's body that is really influencing our vaginal health. And it's not very well understood what all of these organisms are doing, what their functions are, what their benefits are, and how to really uh, capitalize it and enable health through the microbiome. So part of this is one, helping women understand that one, you have a consortia, a group, a combination of really healthy for you microbes in your vaginal environment. And when imbalances occur, that's when things like bacterial vaginosis, that itching, burning, odor that doesn't, isn't normal for you, for example, you mm -hmm. might start to experience that, you know, all of that is related to your vaginal microbiome and imbalances in that microbiome. So one, one part of it is one helping women understand what their my microbiome looks like and when and if there are issues, helping to them to understand what the possibilities are to help restore that. And those are things like probiotics. Sometimes you need antibiotics and oftentimes you go to the physician or go to the doctor, they'll just give you an antibiotic, which will mm -hmm. hopefully help solve the problem, but it might come back again. And so this idea of probiotics and again, supporting a healthy microbiome is something that we are very interested in and are enabling uh, right now with our company. So what Biome AI is really is bringing together one, you know, that's just one piece, the microbiome, bringing together the microbiome, 
also the the aspects of women's health and their trajectory in the healthcare system. So for example, I guess at the beginning, the whole point is to really help drive preventative care. Mm. And using Biome AI and looking at things like diagnostics, like the microbiome or other kinds of diagnostics that exist that you know I'm sure you're aware of, like um, looking at hormone levels or looking at stress levels of cortisol, all of these kinds of things can relate to your health status. What Biome AI is also looking at is the essentially the the claims that are made when you go to the doctor and you, you know, for example, if you go to the doctor with a urinary tract infection, that goes into your medical history file. So we know, for example, if a woman wants to share her data with us, right, so that we can better take care of her long-term care, the idea is we know that you've had UTIs before. We know your vaginal microbiome has E. coli in it, which is probably exacerbating the recurrence of these UTIs. With this information powered by this BioMAI engine, we can potentially help you get to a state where you're no longer getting these UTIs. You're no longer having to go to the doctor or the emergency room or worry about these things from happening. So it's about big, you know, it's about big data in that way in that we can empower the woman to understand much more about herself and give her tools to help maintain health and, and prevent these things from happening in the future. Well, I am a data-driven lady. I love data. Do you think there's enough data yet to make an AI or is that what Femtech Health is going to create is that consortium of data? Exactly. So this is what we're, we're bringing together now. The claim, we're creating all of this, the claims, the diagnostic pieces, all of the, the, you know, the information that the woman is sharing about how she's feeling, what's happening with her, really listening to her, not just the, you know, the, the diagnostic pieces, but of course, devices and biometrics and being able to track fertility and when you're ovulating, all of these things together can help a woman have a picture of her health and how to empower her at any stage of that journey she's on. That's what we're creating. Whew, I have a lot of thoughts. They're like not necessarily pertinent to this interview, but I'm thinking about <laughs> like, are you going to ask women about like what sex toys they have? Because I've definitely in my past have you know, maybe I had a lonely season and overused mm -hmm. my devices and I felt imbalanced. And I was like, oh, I could circle it back to like doing that, you know, and being like, I need to like clean all my devices and like <laughs> maybe take a break. But like, I've never been asked that by my gynecologist. Like how often do you masturbate with external devices? You know, right. is that something that is Femtech Health going to be like the new woke, like woman to woman healthcare that asks those types of questions? You know, that that's the dream. I think, yes, I think the idea <laughs> yeah. is that, you know, we are going to have a, a set of physicians and all of our telemedicine providers will really understand the microbiome and the impacts that external, you know, things have on that. Yeah. Right. So different sexual partners also, yeah. also can cause imbalances, right? Using devices. Women who have recurrent BV are always trying to figure out like, where is this coming from? What's yeah. causing this yeah. imbalance? And so having people that understand exactly what you just said and are aware of these things is really the, the change maker here, because this is the problem. When women, you know, you might find a great doctor who understands this, but oftentimes you might not. And I mean, so it's, yeah. And one that won't shame you, right? If they yeah. ask like, are you at risk of being pregnant? You know, you're supposed to just say, no, like I'm a good girl and I haven't had any unsafe sex and I haven't had any multiple partners at all. I'm, you know, like mm -hmm. whoever I, I mean, I guess I don't know about other people and their appointments with their doctor, but like when asked that, like how often do somebody offer up? Like, well, I had a giant orgy yesterday. Like, <laughs> you know, like just being honest doc. Like, I feel like there's still social expectations, even within that privacy of that relationship that they don't share it. And the reason I'm even bringing all this up, not that this, we have plenty of sexual wellness episodes, y'all. If you want to know more about that, you can go listen to those. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because that is such a big component of the vaginal microbiome, right? Yes, huge. And it's really, really important. And this idea of like, you can't even say the word vagina or talk about these taboo things, you know, that's ingrained in our culture. And it's a part of why, you know, even friends and family, when I started getting to the space, I started asking very frank questions about, yep. okay, you know, do you, you know, my menopausal relatives, you know, do you have vaginal dryness? And they're like, what are you asking me? You know, and then they'll yeah. share, but it, you know, it's destigmatizing these kinds of conversations because it's not something to be ashamed of. It's a part of our biology and it's reality we live with. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, what what are some of the uh, future things you think we'll see from Femtech Health? Is this, first of all, I guess, is it like, is it live or are we still waiting? You said January, right? Jan- hopefully yeah, next so, year, early next year. Early next year, that's right. Cool. And then what do we, uh, give us some, you know, pivots happen, we get it, but what's a long-term vision currently for Femtech Health? So really the long-term vision is to be the destination for women's health from, you know, her early age all the way to, to the end. And it's so that she has this continuum of care and that we, you know, she's really getting care from people who understand women's health. Also for us to invest in research in women's health, which is Mm. vastly under-researched and underrepresented and, and bringing new information and new solutions to women. This idea that, you know, she doesn't have to question where can I get a, an answer to X, Y, and Z that I might not feel comfortable asking, you know, my PCP in my neighborhood, uh, my neighborhood doctor. Uh, so really the, the one-stop shop for women's health from, you know, the beginning until the end with all of the, the issues that come in between mental health, help, like I said, helping to manage financial wellness, all of the things that impact women's lives, not just her reproductive organs, because obviously yeah. there's women more than that. Yeah, that's right. You must have been listening to my show. That's what we say. (laughs) It's very important to me. Absolutely. When I heard you say, I think I did hear you say that on the last episode. And it's, it's very true because it's how I felt very much. So it was like women's health, vaginal stuff, reproductive, fertility. Okay. But we're a lot more complex. Yeah. Periods, babies, and boobs. And I'm like, uh, I have a brain and a heart and a GI tract. Yeah. Um, I actually want to circle back to the research part. I think that's awesome. So is, do you anticipate that Femtech Health has like lab, their own laboratories, their own clinical trials, or like, what is that relationship to research? Cause we can all say we prioritize it, but like, what do you mean by that? Yes. So I think, you know, we're in conversations now to help fund some research with, because, you know, in academia, there's always a a lack of funding for particular things because things get prioritized or deprioritized. So one, helping to collaborate with and and fund research that, you know, physicians or or doctors at at institutions are thinking about doing, especially in the area of fertility and preterm birth, you know, eclampsia, all of these kinds of really important things for, for birth. Uh, but also in areas of menopause, we're, we're conducting trials in these areas to understand this better. It's been researched to a degree, but not to the degree I think it deserves. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, understanding how products and services and behavioral changes can influence health. So that we have data driven outcomes for women and not just, you know, here, this might be good for you. Try it. We actually have evidence for that. You know, and I think the academic world is you know, obviously, you know, I know you've talked about this on your show before, but it's a really important fact that women weren't included in clinical trials until 1993. And then even after that, not very much because there was still this lag, you know, of of really recruiting. And I understand all the rationale behind it as a scientist, but there's a lot we need to do, not just in areas that women care about, but for example, I think there's five times more research done on erectile dysfunction than there is in PMS, which affects, you know, far more women than erectile fun- dysfunction affects men. Mm-hmm. So it's really trying to move the, you know, the, the understanding that we have today into the future. Absolutely. And the last question I have about the research is um, what is Femtech's health um, uh, priority around diversity? So, you know, um, again, we have a lack of data for women, but mm-hmm. God forbid it's a black woman, brown woman, yeah. you know, like, so what are some of your initiatives there? It's super important. I think black women and women, people of color, right, are affected by issues that we're talking about here, oftentimes more so than Caucasian or white women, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, a couple of examples are things like, you know, uterine fibroids and pain, right? And another is, you know, vaginal imbalances in your microbiome. There is a signature of the vaginal microbiome that's much more common in black women because it's heritable. And it's yeah. one of those things that we just see. And, and as a result of that, signature, they are more prone to bacterial vaginosis. Their Mm. pH in the vaginal environment tends to be higher and that's their quote normal, but they have often been told that's you're abnormal, you're outside of the normal range because all the studies were done in white women. And so it's extremely important. And also for, you know, transgender women, right? So they have a neo-vagina, they have microbiome imbalances and needs there too. So helping to reconstitute that environment with microbes that 
help create a healthy environment is very important to us. So diversity is key mm -hmm. for sure. Well, bacteria, vaginas in research. I mean, I can have asked for a better interview. Um, <laughs> those are my favorite topics. So <laughs> <Me> too. <laughs> um, our last two questions are questions that our listeners really love. So the first is, um, if somebody listening wanted to start a femtech company, what is an area in women's health and wellness that you think still needs innovating? I think the, the one that comes top of mind that I, I mentioned earlier is, is the issue of pain. You know, women deal with a lot of various, you know, pain related issues, you know, PMS being one, but in general, they're often dismissed far more than men in terms of what they're experiencing. Like, okay, maybe it's just your time of month or it's in your head. You know, these kinds of things happen more than we would hope. So there are, you know, but beyond pain, which is I think a very important one, all the diseases that women, you know, experience, like Alzheimer's was researched largely in men, but women manifest Alzheimer's in a very different way, right? So looking at heart disease is another one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, women manifest heart disease in a different way. They exhibit and they have heart attacks that are go under, they go undiagnosed often because they have different symptoms than men, right? So mm -hmm. all of any area that seems to be very important in women's health usually has not been directly researched in women. Um, and so diving into that and understanding where the gaps are in that understanding, I think is going to be extremely important in the future. Absolutely. Um, and then our last question is, what do you think the femtech industry as a whole needs the most right now in order to be successful? You know, I think it goes back to sort of removing these point solutions, help bringing things together. Can, you know, we can be a community of service providers, of scientists and doctors and, and business people to help women understand what's out there for them. You know, we right now, the way that the these companies are funded is often, you know, I'm investing in just this one area and we're going to mm -hmm. drive this, help bring these things together uh, and help see women as more than their reproductive organs and look at them across a continuum of care, because maybe we can really advance human health and women's health if we do more preventative care early on in their lives. Um, and listen to what they're saying and the issues that are coming up for them and collaborate with each other. That's one thing you know that I really love about Kaman and about what we're doing is that we're very open to collaboration and to partnering and sharing data because that's how you really change the, the narrative and change the understanding of what's going on. Absolutely. Well, Kim, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for all you're doing for women's health. And we are excited to see where Femtech Health goes next. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Brittany.